Ladies and gentlemen, this is the third of four lectures in a series on the Judeo-Christian tradition. Tonight we will be talking about ethics, politics, and economics in the tradition. Next time we go to sex, guilt, and hell. Uh, so, uh, that's the usual order. In this lecture, we're going to examine the basic ethical position of the Judeo-Christian tradition and the application of that position to politics and economics. <coughs> that basic ethical position I will refer to as <coughs> ethical dualism. Ethical dualism. Ethical dualism is the doctrine that the values which should govern our daily living are given to us from a transcendent source outside the universe and that these values are on many crucial points opposed to the values that we might follow were we to depend merely on reason. The values revealed from the transcendent source are regarded as higher and purer than worldly values. And they are supposed to be definitive of true morality. They are the values that characterize what some of the professors of our academic establishment call, quote, the moral point of view, unquote, or simply moral values or simply morality. Historically, the observing, the observant Jews identified the true and pure values with those of their law, the Torah, and they identified the false values with those of the Canaanites and other non-Jewish people living around them, the high rollers of the time. Yes, who lived a life of luxury and corruption. This transcendent source had to be a god, and the god had to be formless. For if the god had a form, he would represent a limited area of human concern and would be opposed by other gods representing other human interests. Think of Venus versus Diana in Roman mythology. Venus was the goddess of eroticism and Diana was the goddess of chastity and they worked against each other all the time. All pagan religions were of this nature. They constituted a pluralism of values. For instance, the Hindus have a special god for muggers. Uh, say, yes, that's a typical pagan uh, value scheme in religion. They deify competing human values. But the God of the Jews was above and beyond all human values. He didn't have to struggle with any other God. He was the supreme master of the universe, the creator. His values and his laws stood in sharp contrast in opposition to all worldly values. That is why I have called this position ethically dualistic. Now, you mustn't confuse this with the sharp distinction between black and white that characterizes objectivism. Objectivism believes in an ethical duality of good values on the one side and bad values on the other and believes that they are in sharp conflict. Ethical dualism believes that the true values come from beyond, from outside the world, and it's quite a different thing. The position took centuries of conflict 
before it finally crystallized and was proclaimed once and for all in the most uncompromising way by the scribe Ezra uh, in 400 BC. That's E-Z-R-A, I mentioned him before. Well now, the, Judaism asserts the existence of two opposing sets of values, good values and evil values. What now of man? Does he have the ability to choose between the good values and the bad values? In other words, does man have free will? Well, the Jews assert that in every human being there are two urges, one which is called the evil inclination, Yetzer Hara, and the other which is called the good inclination, Yetzer Hatov. Now, the Jews were not radical dualists like the Zoroastrians. I quote the Talmud now to give you the Jewish point of view. Quote, the Holy One, blessed be he, created both inclinations, the good inclination and the bad inclination. The evil inclination exists from birth and continues for the whole of one's life. The good inclination is 13 years younger. It comes into existence at one's bar mitzvah and continues for the rest of one's life, the good inclination. What is the nature of the evil inclination? The evil inclination consists of self-assertion, ambition, and sexual desire. It is man's natural impulse as an inhabitant of this world. How do you know when a person is under the influence of the evil inclination, the Talmud asks. Just watch him. It is when he ogles with his eyes, <laughs> straightens his hair, and walks with a swaggering gait. Now we've already said that God created the evil inclination. And it is written in the Bible that God looked upon all his creation and saw that it was very good. Therefore, argue the rabbis, the evil inclination is good. In fact, very good. <laughs> Why is the evil inclination good? Asks the Talmud. <clears throat> Quote, now here's the answer. Why the evil inclination is good. Were it not for that impulse, a man would not build a house, marry a wife, beget children, or conduct a business. Unquote. In other words, he would not survive. Now, what is the good inclination? It emanates from the law. It is the influence of revelation upon man. It checks, shapes, and often contradicts the evil impulse. There is an ethical ambivalence inherent in the Judaic position. The evil impulse is necessary to survival. It's necessary to thrive in the world, to flourish, as Professor Gotthalf put it. The world is good, therefore the evil impulse is naturally good. Why is it evil then? Because it is liable to get too big for its britches. It's liable to be misused because it leads man to be over-assertive so that he threatens God. And the Bible tells us that Yahweh is a jealous God. You see what happened to Dr. Locke. <laughs> yeah. it, 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 the evil impulse led man, it led man to build the skyscraper of Babel. Against this pride of the evil impulse is set the good impulse or inclination which comes from studying the law. Quote, again from the Talmud, the Holy One, blessed be he, said to Israel, my children, I have created the evil impulse and I have created the Torah as an antidote to it. If you occupy yourself with the Torah, you will not be delivered into the power of the evil impulse. So there is an ethical ambivalence in Judaism. The natural impulses of man are called the evil inclination, 
even though they are necessary to survival, which is good. True morality consists in following the law which is set over and against the evil impulse. In between the evil and the good impulses stands free will. The Judaic tradition more than any other gave us the concept of free will. Although all other events in life may have been decreed by God, the choice between good and evil has not. Man can decide whether to act virtuously or viciously. Behold, says God in the book of Deuteronomy, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. Choose life that thou mayest live, thou and thy seed. Unquote. Free will thus stands in between the good inclination, which urges the individual to do good, and the evil impulse, which urges him to do evil. Man must choose by throwing the weight of his will with one or the other impulse. Some men choose good. They are the good people, the righteous. Some men choose evil. They are the wicked people, the unrighteous. Since both groups are descended from Adam, you can't blame Adam. You must, the individual is responsible. This is the rabbinical view, the view of the Pharisees, whose descendants are today the Orthodox party. Free will has always been the majority view among Jewish religious authorities, and they passed it on to some Christians, whom we will deal with later. Uh, to, the good impulse is embodied in studying the law. If you want to be really good, you go and study the law. To quote the Talmud again, if this despicable thing, the evil inclination, meets you on the way, drag it along to the house of study, unquote. But there are some hints in the Talmud of a tendency toward determinism. The evil impulse may take possession of a man even though he has struggled earnestly against it. What is such a person to do? Well, the determinism is mixed with pragmatism. Quote, if a man sees that his evil impulse is gaining the mastery over him, let him go to a place where he is unknown, put on black clothes, and do as his heart desires. But, but let him not profane the name of God publicly. Now, obviously, this does not mean put on black clothes like Batman and commit murder. It can't mean commit murder. It can't mean commit idolatry. Sin is obviously equated here with, with illicit sex, as in Christianity. The text seems to assume that although in theory it is possible to avoid sin, nevertheless in practice to expect everyone to avoid it is hopeless. The Talmud is divided. Rabbinical authorities are divided on the question of whether any man has ever been sinless. One school maintains that no man has ever been sinless. The other school maintains that four men have been sinless. <laughs> This doctrine might be called statistical determinism, <laughs> as in subatomic physics. Although the Jews are responsible more than anyone else for introducing into Western history the doctrine of the freedom of the will, nevertheless their interest was totally practical and confined to the choice to sin or not to sin. They didn't have quite the same problem as Hamlet, you see to sin or not to sin against God's commandments, they developed no metaphysical theory of the nature of free will or how it could coexist with the evil and good inclinations. Indeed, as the great Jewish historian Josephus remarks, they left all other events to the will of God, that is, to the predestination of God, except the choice between good and evil. It remained for Christianity and Islam to extend the idea of predestination to man's moral choices as well. We now come to the transcendent God uh, as the source of moral values, point number five. 
to simplify greatly, let's take the Ten Commandments and uh, let me just remind you of what I said in the lecture on Judaism. They're supposedly written on two tablets by Moses. The laws on the second tablet direct one to honor one's parents. They forbid murder, adultery, stealing, bearing false witness, coveting what is one's neighbor's. One might think they might be derived from reason, but the Judaic position is that once reason enters, doubt enters. All sorts of qualifications and exceptions may be introduced. Perhaps one's parents are not deserving of honor. In other words, they want to foreclose the possibility of exceptions. They want to make these rules unconditional. And the only way to do this, apart from rational demonstration, is to make them the commandments of an authority who by definition cannot be questioned. A set of authoritarian premises is required. These premises are required by the commandments on the first tablet, I am Yahweh thy God, thou shalt worship no other gods, nor make an image, nor bow down to it, for I am a jealous God, you shall not misuse my name, you shall keep holy the Sabbath. These commandments on the first tablet literally put the fear of God into the sinner. They establish all the other commandments with the force of taboos. And in Jewish history, the law once given kept expanding as the rabbis built what they called fences around the law additional precautionary measures to prevent even unintentional encroachment. The official number of commandments uh, of the law is 613. I started Xeroxing them for you and I realized that I might get into difficulty with copyright problems. <laughs> with Yahweh. So, it was from the Jewish Encyclopedia, so I decided I didn't have time to get permission. Uh, faith and reason, we now come to the section called Faith and Reason, which deals with the epistemology of uh, Judaism. The interest in metaphysics, which so characterized the thinkers of Greece, was absent from the Jews. The Jews started with ethics and they moved on to metaphysical questions only when answering the metaphysical questions was absolutely necessary to buttress their ethical position. Beyond this, they believed it was dangerous to go. The Talmud says, quote, whoever reflects on four things, it were better that he had never been born. What is above, what is beneath, what is before and what is after. <laughs> uh, see the idea. Why, why does the story of creation begin with the letter Beth? Because the letter Beth is closed on all sides and only open in the front. Similarly, you are not permitted to inquire into what is before or what is behind, but only what has existed from the actual time of creation. Action, not inquiry, is the chief thing. This fundamental attitude characteristic of Orthodox Judaism was passed from them to the Christians and to the Muslims all the way down to the Ayatollah. Now I'm going to say a few words about, I'm going to insert a section on the Jewish economic ethics because I want in this lecture to compare it with Catholic and Protestant views on proper economic behavior. Some people are confused by the fact that Jews have been so prominent in capitalistic activity and the defense of capitalism on the one hand, and on the other hand, they've been among the foremost enemies of capitalism. They've been socialists and revolutionaries of different kinds. Now, I think I can answer this question. The Jewish attitude is this worldly. But within the this-worldly attitude, there are two poles, the egoistic and the altruistic, the individualistic, the collectivistic, the ethics of the settled Jew versus the ethics of the nomadic Jew wandering in the desert. And so we always have with us the Jewish primitivist 
wanting to return to a communal state. Nevertheless, the question may be fairly asked, is there any Jewish otherworldliness? The answer is yes, but it is different. It is found in the idea of a messianic age projected to some time in the future. In that messianic age or kingdom of God, all the goodies to enjoy will be material, physical. All the goodies will be here. But the means by which these goodies will be produced will be supernatural. The whole point of view follows the point of view of the consumer. Meanwhile, according to Jewish doctrine, Orthodox doctrine, the dead will be supernaturally raised. The whole family will be reunited. The whole millennial point of view, or messianic point of view as we call it, uh, is still taught by the really orthodox rabbis. Among secular Jews of altruistic orientation, we often see adherence to socialism and even to pure communism as a millennial dream. All the goods will be here and they will be material goods. But how will they be produced and how will prices be determined? That, replied the early Marxists, is an unscientific question. We are not yet at that stage of the dialectic. We will know when we get there, which is just a secular way of saying the goods will be produced and distributed supernaturally. We've already seen that an essentially tribal ethic, when applied to an urban or even an agricultural environment, will not work. Indeed, it does not even work in a nomad environment. And that is why we have civilization, because a few superior nomads got the message. The attempt to make the unselfishness ethics work in the world leads to worldly failure. Those who realized this became egoists, at least on one side of the brain. And they tried to combine that touch of health with a verbal allegiance to altruism on the other side of the brain. Those, on the other hand, who continued to take the tribal ethics seriously generated the idea of a world wherein life is unconditional. I'm now on point seven. Life is unconditional. Wherein all effort, mental and physical, is superfluous. Why? The proof is simple and it goes like this. Mental and physical effort require planning ahead and evaluation with reference to the needs and wants of the self. But this is egoistic and we can't have that. We must have a world in which such activities are unnecessary. So we must somehow abolish the very conditional character of life. Now this is an argument that is implicit in the thinking of all utopians. The conditionality of life requires egoism. Therefore, we must abolish the conditionality of life. When we reach the fourth movement of this logical symphony, we come to a mad finale, allegro molto vivace. <laughs> we must abolish reality. This abolition of reality can be done in two basic ways. To completely spiritualize man by extricating his spirit from his body and sending his spirit to heaven, which is the Platonic answer. It's a Greek answer. Or another way, the Jewish way, leaving man in his body on earth and then to extricate that body together with the whole earthly environment from the curse of conditionality. This is the millennial way. Now the Jews, by the very nature of their value system, were committed to life on earth. And they were committed in the latter part of their development to the doctrine of the resurrection of the body. So they were committed to the second view, that an ideal life lay in a golden age in the future wherein the Garden of Eden would be restored, all work abolished, the conditionality of life for all animal species abolished, 
Food simply drops from the trees into one's hand. The lion lies down with the lamb. The slaughter of animals is abolished and everyone lives contentedly. I guess would have to be on a Pritikin diet. <laughs> Remember, the Garden of Eden was on earth. Now how could such an order be established? Only supernaturally, said the really consistent Jews and Christians. By God's literally taking power and establishing his kingdom over the whole earth. This is what is meant by the kingdom of God or the millennium. Now, there have been Jews and Christians, really ex-Jews and ex-Christians, who have tried to retain their values, the value system of the millennium without the supernatural apparatus necessary to maintain it. And, of course, they are the socialists and Marxists that I referred to a few minutes ago. They proclaim that what they want to establish on earth is the values of the prophets, the ethics of the Sermon on the Mount, but not the dogmatic religious beliefs that lie behind them. I mentioned before the existence of two sects I want to remind you of once again, the Rechabites and the Essenes. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, some people have attempted to revive the pure ethics of the tribe. We have seen this in Judaism among the Rechabites and the Essenes. The Rechabites refused to dwell in towns or to build houses. They were sworn to remain tent dwellers. They refused to plant vineyards. They refused to drink wine. They're one sect. At one time, also, uh, there was a kind of religious order among the ancient Jews known as the Nazirites, N-A-Z-I-R-I-T-E-S, who also abstained from wine and who were forbidden to cut or trim their hair in any way. Then there were the Essenes, or the Dead Sea sect, who lived in a great commune, administered daily baptisms, and laid out military plans for the coming war of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. In Christianity, of course, we have monasticism, but we also have messianism and millennialism, in Islam, we have all sorts of strange sects like this, especially among the Shiites. And we can see it in the present Iranian revolution with its veiling of women and its lust for blood. All these phenomena represent tribalist movements within a settled civilization, which by its nature calls for individualism. Now we come to point nine, Jesus' teaching concerning the politics of the kingdom. We're flipping over on the Christian side now, insofar as Jesus can be called a Christian. Now we come to Jesus' teaching uh, on the politics. Remember, it was a kingdom. He did not preach a republic of God with a bill of rights, but a kingdom of God with a bill of duties. The Messiah was to rule absolutely over the whole earth. Needless to say, there would be no separation of church and state. <laughs> the incident in which Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's, means that as long, he's giving that advice as long as the Romans are around. But he expected God to abolish the Roman power. As for those who were to be the subjects of the kingdom, Jesus expected they would be a select group chosen from the beginning of the world. The evidence of the Gospels is that he believed in predestination. For in one place, he says that God is deliberately stopping the ears of certain people so that they won't hear his message. Again, the use of force is not ruled out by Jesus. Everyone is invited to a great messianic banquet. But people give all sorts of excuses, and Jesus is portrayed as directing his disciples to go out into the highways and byways, to kidnap people, bring them in to, attend, to take the places of those who have refused the invitation. Let's look at his teaching concerning the economics of the kingdom of God. If Jesus had written a book called Superhuman Action, 
a treatise on economics. His views on production, his views on production would have been summed up in the following formula. Consider the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. They toil not, neither do they spin. But their heavenly Father supplieth all their needs. Let it be the same with you. Take no thought for the morrow, what you shall eat or what you shall wear. Your Father in heaven knoweth all your needs. Which of you by taking thought, that is by planning, can add a foot to his stature? Apparently they didn't know about modern technology which could uh, uh, enlarge various parts of the human body. So that just as one's height is a brute fact of nature, so is the appearance of products on the scene. As for consumption, Jesus' ethics is one of self-sacrificing sharing combined with suspicion of wealth. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, he says, than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. If you want to do more than just follow the law, he said to the rich young man, sell your goods and give the payment to the poor. Now we go to the Christian transition to a dualism between the spiritual and the secular. By the year 100, Jesus had not returned, as you probably know. Uh, and the church began to uh, emphasize, to de the church began to de-emphasize its belief in the nearness of the end of the world. Instead, the church began to claim that it was the kingdom of God on earth, a spiritual enclave opposed to what was called the world. So you had the church versus the world. The work of the church was now conceived as the salvation of individual souls by rescuing them from, quote, the world, unquote. This meant freeing them from bodily values and transporting them to a higher realm of spiritual values. Where did the church get that idea? Plato, yes. This is the Platonic influence coming into the church now. Life in the church was conceived as a strenuous preparation for entrance into heaven. Just as Plato had conceived philosophy as a preparation for death, those are his exact words, a preparation for death, so now the church conceived the Christian life. The old Jewish messianic doctrines were replaced by a platonic scheme. The resurrection of the body in the millennium were replaced by the immortality of the soul and its life in heaven contemplating the divine essence. The church now made a sharp distinction between the spiritual realm and the secular. The spiritual was good, the secular bad. We're now moving slowly into the Catholic scheme of things. The church forbade its members in the years 100 to 300, forbade its, this was when the church was being persecuted, uh, the church forbade its members to take any political or military office or to enter the fields of drama, art, rhetoric. For all these were inextricably mingled with idol worship or emperor worship. The church excommunicated any member who became a school teacher because every school teacher had to lead the class in divine reverence to the emperor in the morning. It excommunicated carpenters, stucco workers, cabinet makers, gold leaf beaters, painters, workers in bronze, engravers, florists, anyone else who indirectly contributes to pagan temple worship. No participation in war, gladiatorial fighting, or capital punishment was allowed. The pagans naturally felt that if Christianity prevailed, society would go to pieces. This did not happen. Now, actually, there were many Christians during this period who managed to find a way of compromise. Uh, they, some of them even became pagan priests or flamens, F-L-A-M-E-N-S. A flamen is a pagan priest. 
the pluralist flamentes, really. Uh, um, and uh, they would preside at ceremonies in which the emperor's statue was worshipped, even though they carefully evaded worshipping the emperor's statue themselves. These Christian pagan fla flamentes would have long sticks around which were wound flowers, and they would come to the fore in a Roman city and they would say, will the emperor worshiping party please proceed? And the poor other uh, people had to come out and worship the emperor and the flamens would lead them and suddenly he would disappear around the corner. So that gives you the idea of how some Christians managed to survive. The uh, society did not immediately go to pieces. And the reason was what we call the Constantinian establishment. The Constantinian establishment. Uh, I'm at point number 12 now. By the Constantinian establishment is meant literally the establishment of Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire. This took place in the fourth century by a series of official acts. But the term Constantinian establishment has acquired at the hands of historians a far deeper meaning. In this deeper sense, it refers to the alliance between the church and the secular order that lasted from the 4th century to the 19th century. The dominant notes were compromise, mutual support, a sharing of the spoils, the blessings of the church on the established political and economic order, persecution of heretics, Jews, pagans, uh, by the state. Most of the professions were now reopened to the Christians. In many towns, the bishop was the most important man in town. Augustine, for instance, complains that as Bishop of Hippo, he spent more time mediating lawsuits and presenting petitions than he did on church matters. In this situation, the church continued to preach its ideal which was that of primitive communism. St. John Chrysostom, Bishop of Constantinople, proclaimed from the pulpit his desire to turn the capital city into a communistic fellowship of agape, or selfless love. But in the same sermon, he calms the fears of his wealthy listeners by telling them that in the present sinful world, such ideas are impossible to put into practice. Now, since most Christians in the fourth century lived in cities, they engaged in trade. But from the church's standpoint, trade was regarded as ethically lower than agriculture or manual labor. It was in theory permissible only when the selling price equaled the cost of production plus a moderate profit, the sum necessary to gain a living. Only retail trade was regarded as respectable. The church forbade any wholesale business which involved credit and interest, which it called usury, of course. To justify this, it appealed to the Jewish law that interest must not be accepted from one's fellow religionists. The idea beyond this, behind this prohibition was based on a complete ignoring of the role of interest in production. The idea instead was the concrete image that the image of a man who's already ruined in business who needs a loan to tide him over. The money lender is lying in wait for such men. He gives them their loans, and then when they are unable to repay the loan and in interest, he seizes their property at law. That's the concrete image they had in mind, the, the opponents of usury. Christians had no concept of increasing productiveness and a rising standard of living. The good in the world consisted in the fact that one could satisfy one's minimum needs at a moderate level of comfort by engaging in trade within the limits allowed by the church. These limits were meant to restrain the sin of greed. 
The church got the state to regulate or prohibit the taking of interest or the earning of profit it deemed excessive. With the goal of restraining lust, the church got the state to regulate the arts and the theater and to censor books. It is important to notice that all these prohibitions were based on the Jewish tribalist element in Christianity. It was not until the high Middle Ages that the authority of Aristotle was appealed to to prove that the taking of interest was against the natural law because money by its nature was barren. So by and large, the life of a scrupulously observant Catholic Christian fluctuated between a moderate self-indulgence and an ascetic severity. It was the deep conviction of many that moderate self-indulgence was conceding too much to the world. This conviction, added to the conviction that the church itself was becoming too worldly, resulted in the institution of monasticism. Thousands withdrew away from the worldly church in order to live in the desert. These monasteries became drains on the rest of society and hotbeds of fanaticism. Many monks, unwilling to live in monasteries, which they found too corrupt, withdrew to the far desert to become solitaries where they practiced extremes of fanaticism. Some lived in swamps till they were covered by mosquito bites. Others lived on the top of pillars and were known as stylites, S-T-Y-L-I-T-E-S. The story of St. Simeon Stylites, who lived on a pillar, the top of a, of a pillar at least 50 feet high, uh, with a fence around the top so he wouldn't roll off when he was sleeping. He lived there for 39 years. His food was sent up to him in a basket, and there was also a basket coming down. <laughs> See, the Roman emperor himself used to go and stand at the bottom of the pillar and call up to Simeon for advice on how to settle theological controversies. We now, we've covered uh, at least in part, the Catholic point of view. Uh, let's come to the Protestant ethic of um, econ the economic ethics. The economics of the Judeo-Christian tradition must be understood not only in terms of Judaism and Catholicism, but also of Protestantism. We cannot pause to discuss the theology of the Protestant Reformation, except to note that it included a breakdown of the distinction between the sacred and the secular, repeal of the doctrine of the superiority of the monastic life, the emphasis on the everyday, workaday life of the ordinary man as the road to salvation, emphasis on business and the secular family home as workshops of salvation. All this was based in turn on the doctrines of absolute predestination, justification by faith alone, and individual responsibility to God without the mediation of the priest. These doctrines I've explained in outline in my lectures on Protestant fundamentalism. It is important to realize that there were two versions of the Protestant ethic, the Lutheran and the Calvinistic. The Lutheran prevailed in North and East Germany, in Scandinavia, Finland, and Estonia. The Calvinist prevailed overwhelmingly in Switzerland, the Netherlands, Scotland, among the French Huguenots, and to a sufficient degree in England and the United States for us to identify it as the WASP ethic. Well, now let's look for a few moments at the Lutheran economic ethics. Lutheranism is closer to Catholicism than is Calvinism, and Lutheranism retains much of the medieval agricultural class stratified outlook. The raw materials of nature are gifts of God, and the fact that man has to appropriate them by toil is his punishment for sin. Hard work is a remedy for sin, and its significance is ascetical and manifests itself in precision 
and technical exactitude. Possibility for one's work is a matter of self-discipline. There you have the basis of the German devotion to good work, the uh, production of technically precise products. There's no recognition of the role of productivity in work in Lutheranism. It's just a penance. Private property is ordained by God as a second thought to preserve the social order in a fallen world. The ideal state would be primitive communism, reversion to which is permissible in times of famine, state need, or economic need. This is known as the doctrine of the compulsory bargain. Men should be allowed to accumulate as much private property as they need to maintain their class rank. The economic order consists in living within one's class standards. It is the duty of the government to protect this order and to guarantee its permanence. Those classes in direct contact with nature, the feudal landowners and the peasants, are to be regarded as naturally superior orders together with the soldiers and bureaucrats who protect them. Middlemen and merchants, however, are necessary evils. Here we have the doctrine lying behind Bismarckian conservatism, German blood and soil socialism, and ultimately Nazism, and also behind uh, Scandinavian welfare statism. Now let's look at Calvinism, which is the real WASP uh, economic ethics. Calvinism shared with Lutheranism a high evaluation of work, regarding work as a form of worship to which all men were equally called, and also as a means of self-discipline and the sublimation of uh, aggressive and lustful desires. Work was a universal duty. Monks were banished and beggars were arrested as vagrants. The economic ethic of Calvinism also shared with Lutheranism its anti-mammon spirit, its emphasis on modesty and moderation. It instituted laws against luxury, which it prosecuted with unusual severity. Calvin also believed that poverty encouraged the Christian virtues, and he violently denounced the great Catholic trading centers of Venice and Antwerp. However, Special circumstances reversed the anti-capitalistic trends in Calvinism. Calvin's own city, remember Calvin, which city Calvin ruled? What was it? Geneva. It was a town of 20,000 people based on a mercantile rather than an agricultural economy. It could maintain its independence and therefore Calvin's rule only by successful competition in trade with nearby cities like Lyon. When Geneva lost its cloth and velvet trade to Lyon, Calvin acted vigorously and introduced the manufacture of watches, uh, which are on everybody's wrist today. Calvin was a practical man who emphasized those aspects of behavior which were possible for men to achieve he therefore quickly integrated his work ethic with the rising capitalistic spirit. He repealed the Catholic laws against usury, and he supported a doctrine of credit that was at least a little nearer the modern idea. However, lending at interest was regulated. Only that interest was allowed which was to be plowed back into production. People were not allowed to live on interest. No interest was to be taken from the poor. Loans were not to be refused for lack of securities. The maximum rate of interest was to be set by the state. The Calvinist ethic had more appeal to businessmen than the Catholic or the Lutheran ethic. The reasons were that success in business in Calvinism was regarded as a sign that one was one of the elect, predestined by God to eternal salvation. This was because success in business was the result of planning ahead and putting order in one's life. In Calvinism, order was a sign of the divine rule, disorder or chaos, a sign of the rule of the devil. He who rules his own life is probably under the rule of God. 
since the doctrine of predestination creates a certain anxiety in people, you know, am I predestined or am I not to salvation? Since it creates this anxiety as to whether one is oneself one of the elect, the presence of signs of order in one's life uh, is a reassuring external mark that a person is one of the elect. Those who waste their time and throw away money uh, gam on gambling and women are called reprobates or the unchosen. No pity is to be wasted on them. However, Calvin taught that there is no one-to-one -one correlation between health and salvation. There are the idle rich and there are the undeserving poor. There are the idle rich and the undeserving poor. The idle rich flaunt their wealth. These are to be condemned. Then there are the deserving poor who work hard but whom circumstances deprive of success. To the deserving poor, charity is proper. To the bums, none. What ought a businessman to do with his wealth? He ought not to spend it in luxury or vulgar display, but save it and plow it back into the business. Thus arose the Calvinist social ethic, which has two elements, the productive and the altruistic. The altruistic element is evident in the emphasis on charity for the deserving poor as a major virtue, on scholarships and foundations of every kind, and on dedication to a life of public service. Calvinist man must show his worth, not merely by hard work and the amassing of wealth, but by public service. This is the WASP ethics. Now, uh, I come to point number 14, the contemporary reversion to primitive messianism. <coughs> Finally, the uncomfortable alliance between Christianity and capitalism began to dissolve in the 19th century when churches were more and more disestablished and became more voluntary organizations. One of the results, one of the changes was that the major Christian denominations ceased to be so interested in saving individual souls and began to turn their attention once more to changing the social order. This meant the breakdown of the Constantinian establishment in the broad sense and the reversion to primitive Judaic messianism, the belief that the kingdom of God could be established on earth. This took three forms. One, the expectation that Jesus would soon return to establish the millennium. Two, the social gospel. And three, liberation theology. The first I have described at length in my lectures on Protestant fundamentalism. The second and third I will now deal with. First, the social gospel. In the first half of the 20th century, the leaders of many of the establishment Protestant churches in America had basically lost their faith in supernatural Christianity. This loss of faith was intellectual. It was due to their knowledge of science and of the critical study of the Bible. They asked themselves, what was left of Christianity? They answered, the values it teaches, the values of altruism and self-sacrifice. The importance of Christ's death on the cross was not that it had saved the world, but that it was the supreme example of self-sacrifice. A ministry, therefore, could regain a sense of social relevance by preaching and working for the, for the values of Jesus rather than for the doctrine that he was the savior of mankind. In this way, they could help bring in the kingdom, as they put it. Pulpits subsidized by businessmen resounded with denunciations of the selfishness of capitalism. The Protestant clergy in this way implanted in the minds of American businessmen the thought that they were doing something unworthy and immoral by making money, and that they could only put meaning back into their lives by large donations to charity, by working in public service, or participating in various kinds of prison reform or other social reform, or by promoting government regulation of business. 
Once the depression had hit, businessmen influenced by the preaching of such clergy were foremost in supporting the New Deal. The most articulate clergyman of the social gospel movement was a man named Walter Rauschenbusch. Walter Rauschenbusch. Another was the Reverend Norman Thomas, the perennial socialist candidate for president. It should be noticed that the movement spread to reform Judaism as well, and many reform rabbis were led to declare that as long as the teachings of Jesus rather than his divinity were preached in Christian churches, there was little to distinguish Christianity from Judaism. It was at this time that the term Judeo-Christian tradition became current. But the social gospel was an upper-class movement, largely dissociated from anything revolutionary. We cannot say the same of the next movement, which will be our final topic. This is liberation theology. In the 1960s, a new school of thought came to the fore in the Catholic Church. This school of thought at first called itself the theology of hope, but later adopted the name liberation theology. It was led by the left wings of the Jesuit and Dominican orders, the two most learned orders in the Catholic Church. They were assisted by priests and nuns of all orders in the church, especially Franciscans who have always worked with the poor, as well as by thousands of parish priests and hundreds of bishops in transforming what was essentially a school of thought into an active social movement. The liberation theology people made the Protestant social gospelers look like parlor pinks. The Protestant social gospel, uh, gospelers had been essentially reformers whereas the liberation theology people were revolutionaries of the most radical kind. A consideration of their theological position and of their activities will throw much light on everything that we have been saying so far. The liberation theologians reject entirely the Constantinian establishment, its vertical concept of salvation, extricating the individual soul from the body, and it's compromise with the world, telling your parishioners, don't worry, we're not going to put the kingdom of God into effect in the world. The liberation theologians advocate that the church go back to the original Jewish concept of redemption in the sense of redemption from slavery in Egypt. It is the duty of the church, they say, to redeem people, not to save them, to redeem them from all sorts of oppression economic oppression by capitalism, political oppression by dictators, they mean, they mean right-wing dictators, racial oppression and war. All these kinds of repression are only expressions of selfishness, say the liberation theologians. Man must be liberated from selfishness in order that the kingdom of God may come in. The liberation theologians point out that wherever there is a movement to liberate oppressed people, some Christian within the movement is at the forefront. Martin Luther King, for example, who conceives himself as another Moses. The starting point of Christian theology, they say, is Christian commitment to the poor and their struggle for liberation. This commitment grows out of Christian faith working through love. Borrowing the Marxist concept of praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S, or intellectually guided action in the world, the liberation theologians call for orthopraxy, O-R-T-H-O-P-R-A-X-Y, orthopraxy, or correct practice as prior to orthodoxy or correct belief. In the experience of orthopraxy, or solidarity with the oppressed, comes the insight that the church as an institution must give up the notion of any otherworldly salvation that tolerates or condones what they call the social injustices of the world. 
If individual Christians wish to be redeemed, they must get involved in the historical process of liberation here and now. In other words, they must go into politics, left-wing politics, now. Especially in the third world, they must join with the Marxists in their war against capitalism and colonialism. Most liberation theologians are explicitly committed to a socialist economy, and most are committed to active cooperation with Marxists in achieving it. In some mysterious way, human political action is the incarnation of God's redemptive plan for mankind. Union with Christ is relating to this, mark, to this redemptive process. It is struggling to build the kingdom of God. This struggle to build the kingdom of God invo uh, involves, writes one Jesuit, quote, a priority of utopian perspectives over factual ones a priority of utopian perspectives over factual ones to those who work in hope, unquote. In other words, we need not devote ourselves to a factual study of economics in order to discover whether a socialist economy is workable, whereas Marx had declared that any such factual study is unscientific, the liberation theologians proclaim that it is irreligious. It goes against hope, they say, and the dimension of hope negates that of fact. Dialectic, you see, the Hegelian influence here. This is merely a Christian version of Marxism. Or you can put it another way around. Marxism is the secular version of Christianity. For consider the three main virtues of Christianity, faith, hope, and charity. The Marxist equivalent of faith is raised class consciousness. The feeling that one is being oppressed plus commitment to the proletariat as the agent of liberation. The Marxist equivalent of hope is the blind trust that somehow a socialist economy is possible. And the Marxist equivalent of charity is identification with all the oppressed. Arise ye wretched of the earth is therefore just another way of saying, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. You cited those parts of the Gospels that were uh, anti work and anti productivity. The same Gospels teach uh, the parable of the talents, which, uh, which calls on men to be productive and to be productive and investigative. Can you reconcile those things or comment on I can't I reconcile them. There is also, I might add to your evidence, uh, uh, the one in which he. Uh, approves of uh, the um, adherence to contract, the parable of the vineyards, you know, when people came in early and they got promised a certain amount of, uh, of pay for the day and those who came in later said that to be given the same amount was unfair. And Jesus said, uh, it's, you got what you bargained for, he said to the people who had come in early, uh, I did the best I could on the market. I think... Uh, that it is, in the first place, it is very difficult to see what Jesus' actual point of view in economics was. For another thing, I think that he was trying to make a moral in each of these parables, and he was basing it on the nature of contract per se, and that people should not expect to gain more than they have contracted for. So he had another message behind each of the parables in question. Now, what I quoted for, uh, from was not, I think it was not from any parables, but from statements that he made, which seemed to me to reflect an actual systematic economic attitude. So it's the fact that there are parables that probably make the difference. Yes. yes. The person in the white... Was there, I didn't get one word. Was there any, what came after any? Case, any instance in which the employment or the advocacy of uh, social gospel is used to result in or uh, in the dropping of the uh, concept of the supernatural? 
Oh, yes, the Unitarian Church. Uh, the question was, well, wait a minute, did you say, I'm not sure that I, I did get it. Was there any case in which the social gospel did not result in the dropping of, did result, the Unitarian Church is one, is one good example. They just substituted the ethics of Jesus, as they put it, for... The question was, uh, <laughs> did the social gospel... <laughs> I answered it now. <laughs> Can you give an example? He said, he said, Bob, uh, uh, Bob Dunn uh, asked, uh, will you please give an example of a case in which the social gospel resulted in the dropping of the dogmas of traditional Christianity? And I answered the Unitarian Church would be one example that I can think of. Norman Thomas would be another example, and it was most, mostly uh, the, the liberal ministers who had a very, very uh, diluted views of the dogmas of the church uh, that in every denomination who did this. I don't know. Would you happen to know? I think that he just stopped mentioning all religion and went over entirely to socialism as a religion and ceased preaching it as the social gospel eventually, as many people did. Yes. I was wondering religion or whatever is so secret. I wonder if anybody would do anything about it. Well, by your premise. I would have to be a Mason and would be forbidden to divulge <laughs> what I knew. Actually, however, in reality, the, the question was, is the, is the Masonic order a religion? Isn't that right? What is it? <laughs> well, it developed out of a guild of Masons in England, actual medieval Masons who gradually began to expand their membership to more and more honorary members until they finally became essentially a social group. And as the Middle Ages uh, developed, uh, cities became more and more important and they became defenders of urban interests and ultimately the Masons became defenders of capitalism. And as the Masonic lodges spread, they spread the Enlightenment and they spread the uh, pro-capitalistic attitude. Many of the founders of our country uh, were uh, Masons. Isn't that true, Arthur? Is Arthur Lowe? Yeah, So you see, they were a sort of pro-capitalist church, in essence. Now, what they are today, I don't know. Pardon? 80% of the people who signed the Bill of Rights were Masons. That tells a story, doesn't it? evaluate the impact of Thomas Aquinas on the history of Christianity and the development of Western civilization? That's a, how would I evaluate the impact of Thomas Aquinas on the history of Christianity and the development of Western civilization? <laughs> Yes. I omitted the entire high Middle Ages. Uh, what uh, Aquinas did was essentially to 
restore the importance of reason in Europe. Uh, and he divided man into two autonomous parts, the part which was involved in salvation and, and the reason per se. Uh, Aquinas believed that man had not fallen so far as Augustine, essentially. He, he never said that in so many words. He de-emphasized the importance of the fall. And Aquinas maintained that the ideal man would be a kind of a mixture of Aristotle and St. Francis Assisi. That is, he would have developed all the virtues of Aristotle, about which you have heard so much from Professor Gotthelf. And on top of these, he would have the so-called crown uh, of grace, the super-added gift, as he called it, of faith, hope, and charity. And therefore, he, he, he managed to make a place for the autonomous operation of reason within Western civilization. And he managed to make a place in Catholicism for that. Uh, and so therefore, he's essentially a kind of an Apollonian influence in, in Catholicism. Now, how to evaluate his total impact is a, a much broader question, which I cannot possibly answer in a short time. Yes. Gentlemen with the glasses. Yes, Jack. Uh, um, if by existentialism you mean the Protestant existential theology as well, and one takes people like Reinhold Niebuhr in this country, Karl Barth in Switzerland, and so on. Now, you ask what was the influence of this movement on whom? Well, um, let's take the thought of Reinhold Niebuhr as an example. Uh, Niebuhr, in effect, embraced the importance of working for, quote, social justice, unquote, in the social democratic sense. But at the same time, he said, you must realize that we are all under judgment by God. Even in the process of working for better conditions, we are ourselves saddled with a kind of a power motif and therefore are imperfect. Therefore, men cannot by their actions really bring in the kingdom of God at all. All they can do is restrain evil in the world. Uh, and in the case of Karl Barth, the way in which it ultimately turned out was that he opposed Nazism and he then turned around and opposed anti-communism. Uh, so that would be, that's one line of answer to your question. Well, the notion of God is dead was the last cry of despair on the part of the clergy who wanted to be relevant to college students at the time. I remember in one university in North Carolina, they're holding a funeral in the chapel for God. Uh, and some of the girl students were fainting with uh, ecstasy as God was, God's coffin was carried in. Uh, I don't think the God is Dead movement, hit, hit, I don't think it was very important. I don't think it lasted very long. Some people said he is not dead, but hiding in Argentina. Uh, uh, <laughs> this gentleman. He said that according to one Jewish tradition, there were there have been four sinless human beings. Is that Alan Gaho? <laughs> uh, All I know is one is Elijah, and I think another was Noah. Remember how Noah was saved? The young, uh, that's why he was in the ark. Uh, and who the other two were, I do not know. Who? No, 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 no. this is according to the Talmud. 
in the Talmud, uh, Christ is never mentioned uh, explicitly for a very good reason. Uh, uh, if the church ever got hold of a copy of the Talmud in which there was a comment on Christ, they would burn the whole copy of the Talmud. So therefore in the Talmud he's referred to, Jesus is referred to as a certain person. Uh, or Ben Pantera or Ben Pandera because of the story told in the Talmud that Jesus was really the illegitimate son of a Roman soldier named Pantera. So sometimes he's called Ben Pantera. Uh, he's otherwise, he's, ne he's never explicitly mentioned. Yes? Well, well, in Lutheranism specifically, what are the roots of anti-Semitism in Christianity? Uh, specifically in Lutheranism? Uh, Luther at first thought that all the Jews would turn to Lutheranism as soon as he had reformed the church. And uh, from his experience of disappointment in part, uh, he became anti-Semitic. Now, the roots of anti-Semitism in Christianity uh, ought to be fairly obvious that Jews, Christianity was a Jewish sect. The Jews refused to accept it. They excommunicated them. They threw them out of the synagogues. The Jews and the Christians got each other constantly into trouble with the Roman government. They were constantly accusing each other. The Christians burned the Jewish synagogues and the emperors made the Christian churches rebuild the synagogues and so forth and so on. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, as sometimes happens with uh, uh, organized movements that are somewhat related ideologically, uh, they hated each other. Uh, now that's a, a simplistic... Uh, 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 answer, I realize. Uh, but wherever there is a minority uh, who are able uh, and successful, as the Jews have been always, they tend to be hated by uh, the people who, uh, whom the Jews or whoever they are, Armenians or Chinese or whatnot, uh, uh, deprive of, uh, so they think, of success by their very existence. So there were all sorts of secular quote, reasons, unquote, for anti-Semitism. And religious ideology only added fuel to the fire. And collectivism is a way of looking at things. Uh, yes? Um, I can't. I've been reading a lot of leaders about the uh, warning against Christians. Uh, somebody, I read somewhere recently, I don't know if it's true or not, there are 50 million in the United States. It's just worried me. What I'm wondering is, um, that sometimes it seems that when you read an intellectual historian or philosopher or whatever these days, they have one or two opposite viewpoints. One is that Christianity is on the decline and it's just being washed away by science and so forth. And the other is that it's a tremendous upsurge and the born against Christians and so on are going to take over. I'm wondering what do you see as the future of Judaism and Christianity? I think I'd rather leave that. I'm going to deal with it in the next lecture. Yes. Well, generally speaking, the question is what kind of ethics were the Egyptians and Babylonians and Chinese and so forth and so on following at the time the Ten Commandments came into existence? Uh, they were generally following law codes which had been given to them by their kings and had the authority of the king behind, behind it. In the case of... Uh, uh, of some of the societies, there was very little connection uh, with religion. The gods, for instance, of Greece and Rome were not exactly moral in their behavior, uh, even in terms of accepted Greek morality, and therefore there was rather a disjunction of religion and ethics in many of the large urban societies. Um, it's that, again, is a complex matter which it just can't be answered by standing on one foot. Uh, 
Yes. Why I'm standing in one. Could you compare the uh, philosophy of sense of life found in the Old Testament versus the New Testament and explain which one you think is less malevolent? Well, I think that uh, I think that by and large, Judaism is less malevolent. By and large, uh, uh, again to compare them in detail is what I have been doing in these last two lectures. And uh, what do you think? What? I've heard a lot of detail, but I was having trouble drawing the connections. Uh -huh. I think that observant Judaism uh, has a one life-denying defect, which is encouraging obsessiveness uh, and worry, uh, which uh, is to be found rather less in Christianity. But that's a psychological rather than a philosophical phenomenon. Yes. Yes. Well, you probably will remember immediately as soon as I mention that. When did she? She, uh, the lady is suggesting that maybe I was wrong and. And, uh, or she was questioning whether Jesus had ever advocated violence. Well, he even engaged in violence. Does anyone remember? <laughs> Cleansing of the temple, overturning the tables of the money changers in the temple. Uh, certainly he thought that political violence was sometimes necessary. On the other hand, at the time the Gospels were written, the authors of the Gospels were very anxious to get in good with the Roman government, and therefore they tended to play down this whole aspect of the stories of Jesus. For instance, when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, as you will remember, uh, St. Peter is supposed to have pulled out his sword and cut off the ear of a servant of the high priest, and Jesus uh, told him not to resort to force. Uh, but anyway, St. Peter was carrying a, a knife, a sword. Yes, there are some scholars who believe that Jesus was an actual zealot, that is a revolutionary, but actually so little can be established about Jesus that it's hard to say. How did our system of measuring the years in terms of Christ's birth begin? That began somewhat after the year 500, I don't, uh, a little after the year 500. I, I don't know the details. It was obviously by a Christian. Uh, the gentleman on the end of it. I was wondering, you, uh, you described how the Jews thought that we had these three things, the uh, good, the evil, and the free will. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, you thought there might be any connection at all between that and Freud's idea of the ego and the Hmm. <laughs> I, I think that's a great suggestion. I, uh, I don't know that Freud knew very much about Judaism. I doubt that he ever read the Talmud, or, uh, but something in the tradition may have come down to him that there's a good way to, a good impulse in man, a bad impulse in man, and in between stands the executive function, which, however, Freud was not very willing to identify with free will. I mean, the ego itself was determined, you see, by unconscious impulses and so forth and so on. So Freud's determinism is an obvious departure from the Judaic tradition. Three more. Uh, the lady in blue, the blue and black stripes. When you talk about the, the bad inclination, the good inclination, or Yetzerara and Yetzerato, uh, you uh, say that the Yetzerara is the, the means for survival. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, what, uh, it is a little bit, uh, there is something uh, contradicted because uh, 
uh, in the sentence, uh, here I'm giving you the bad and the good, and you, you have to choose life. So life is connected here yes. with the Yetzer So how do you explain that? Well, the, you... <laughs> <laughs> That's a, the Yezer Hatov. I don't have the good Hebrew pronunciation. Is the is the good inclination, and the Yetzer Hara is the evil inclination. Now, the evil inclination supports life in the sense that it supports survival. And, and you've got to have a certain amount of, let's put it this way, aggression and lust and so forth and so on in order to make it in the world. But at the same time, if you allow this inclination to expand indefinitely until you are spending all your time just building houses and selling real estate and... Uh, 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 getting Nobel Prizes and so forth and so on. It becomes ultimately a way of death because it turns you away from the proper balance which is revealed to you in the law which is called the way of life. And so therefore, when in the book of Deuteronomy God says to the Jews, I put before you two ways, the way of life and the way of death, he meant the way of life for you Jews to survive. This is the way which if you follow as a group, an ethical way, you will ultimately survive. That's the way of life. The other way, you'll just go to pieces like the other, you know, in the Passover service, the Babylonians and the Assyrians, and they mention all the people who have disappeared from the surface of the earth and the Jews are remaining. And so it is a way of life in that sense because their own ethnic identity has been maintained by the law. Now, there is another sense, however, in which the evil inclination is the way of life, and that is that you need a certain amount of aggressiveness uh, and selfishness in order to survive. So the contradiction that you saw there is something that I said was built in as an ambivalence in the Judaic ethic. Yes? So if, if the, uh, the difference between the, the, the good and the bad inclination uh, is only uh, in measurement, what fills some points. Perhaps it is not a, a, a dualism. dualism yeah. It is uh -huh. some kind of, of, uh, of, of uh, process which is one. So perhaps the dualism uh, explanation is not, not somehow not, not, not true or not, not, uh, not accurate. Maybe the word dualism was the wrong one for me to use as a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Well, from the fact that it's supposed to come as a commandment from outside and from the fact that people who follow these commandments often fail in life, like Job, you say, uh, that the, the evil prosper and the good man is punished. Uh, people have drawn the uh, conclusion that the moral, moral values are not necessarily the values of success, that there's a, a problem of evil. Even though we follow the law, we get swept up in the Holocaust. And so it's this aspect which I call dualism, which I do have some reservations about. You remember I said at one point it was not as strong as the Zoroastrian dualism, where you have two gods that are fighting against one another. So. I would, suggest, I would accept your criticism as a modification of what I, I have said. Thank you. How many more, George? Uh, has anyone got a question which I... A short question, Mr. Chairman?